Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. This podcast is presented by Blockworks Group, the only blockchain event and media production company I trust. For exclusive content and events that provide insight into the crypto and blockchain space, visit them at blockworksgroup.io. I promise you won't be disappointed. My guest today is a co-founder of Alchemist. His name is Steven Neroff, and there isn't a project, a coin, a token, a legal opinion, a conference, or anyone who doesn't know about Steven, or Steven doesn't have some involvement in. Most well-known, he was on the early team that founded Ethereum, and he is well known for innovating the legal concept of the utility token, which has been referred to as the architect of the initial coin offering. Stephen, welcome for, to the show. Hey, Charlie. Thanks for having me. So, I mean, when when most people got involved in crypto, you know, we were all like kids living in our parents' basement. But you were one of the first, I guess, professionals. Um, you uh, you're practicing attorney and um, business development, and you do a lot of different things. And when you came into the space, you were the first wave of professionals that said, "Hey, we need to make this space real and not just a bunch of a bunch of kids." Yeah. So when I saw this, um, I, I was coming into it with like twenty plus years of. Uh, being a tech entrepreneur, both in Silicon Valley and New York. And this kind of, you know, hit me as the most disruptive technology I had ever seen. Um, what made you feel that way? You know, it was, it was, a, it was, look, it was a combination of two things. It was one, you know, I come from a libertarian, you know, bent, and I always thought like, you know, the money's, the monetary policies and, and you know hyperinflation and everybody's heard the story that's going to end so horribly. And when I saw Bitcoin, I remember literally it was the first after I read the white paper, I said, "Oh my God, this is the new monetary system." And so what shocked me about it was that I thought it would come through like a revolution or hyperinflation. I didn't expect it to be in my background a technology solution. So those two combinations, being a tech entrepreneur and being, you know, um, a student of economic theory uh, combined together is what captured me like right away. Bitcoin was more of like a, like you said, it wasn't coming through a, an armed coup or a, a revolution. It was just a, a white paper showing up on a mailing list somewhere that no one reads. And to me, I, it was like, so I was there in the early days of the Internet in Silicon Valley and that was very like edgy and you know the internet was thought of as you know horrible people are on the internet and you know i was hearing all the same things here and i love that environment actually you know i think that's where innovation comes out of you know it's not going to come out of the you know the the monolithic companies it's going to come out of you know people that are on the bleeding edge what do you mean by that were there like were there like um, parallels between the early days of the internet and the early days of the the crypto space, Bitcoin, oh my God. Ethereum. Uh, yeah, the parallels are. Uh, in, in some ways, if you want to see where Web 3.0, what we're looking at right now, is going, you look back at Web 1.0. Uh, the Internet initially was thought to be a place where scams were going to happen, where um, there was, uh, you heard the words um, uh, the money laundering, <laughs> you heard the word terrorism. A lot you know, of porn. Yeah, all the same scary stuff that you heard right now. Meanwhile, you had this edgy group of like really, you know, inspired entrepreneurs, many of which were like 19, 20 years old. You know, I was in my 20s and it was just like we were like, oh, my God, this is revolutionary. This is going to change the world. And so I think the parallels there was like, you know, it was like if you looked at the technology 
and you looked at society and you said to yourself, okay, if this technology actually becomes ubiquitous and everybody is on this technology, then what's the implications of that? You know, and so like we were, we were when the edgy guys in the beginning, and I like to include myself in that, we were not thinking, you know, AOL or even let's call the the Lycos of the world, the Yahoo's of the world. You know, we didn't envision Facebook, but we envisioned it a, a world where billions of people are going to be on this. And what does that mean when billions of people can communicate with each other? And, and like we saw that that was like absolutely game changer. And what so you, were the early implications of the internet or what you perceived the early implications to be? And then how did it play out? Uh, so the early implications, of, uh, so what I thought was that the individual was going to um, become more important um, and, and rise. Um, and, and I think that's happened, right? That, that was one of my main theses, uh, where you started seeing like online communities, like the globe, if, ever, if anybody remembers that back in the day. Um, and those were precursors to Facebook. And like, what, you, what do you see today? What do they call today? They're called influencers. Mm. And so you, you have these like people that literally, just because they're, they have something to say, like, Charlie Shrem, and you can go out there and say it. And because enough people are interested in what he has to say, and we're interested in what he has to say, you know, then he becomes a voice out there. Where we went back in the day when the internet started, remember that world, what we were looking at was ABC, NBC, and CBS. And that was it. And, 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 and a bunch of like lousy radio stations, you know, and so there wasn't. But they were way- still influencers back then. You had like uh, Steve Jobs was an early influencer and Linus Torvald was an early influencer. They still influenced people. They spoke at conferences. They just didn't do it on social media at a huge global scale. Yeah. So the influencers were able to do it through corporations, mostly. Um, or they were stars on one of the networks, right? So those were the way the influences happened. You didn't have, you know, I, you know, like a, a, maybe what blew it open was Kim Kardashian, right? And and it's, you, it kind of seems trite to like use the Kardashians as an example, but no, but Kardashian, she was the first influencer. You're right, Even absolutely. Paris Hilton. And so Kardashian, Kim Kardashian is actually a direct descendant of. TCPIP and the protocol <laughs> and it's like that led all of that led to Kim Kardashian and the explosion you know after and so we didn't anticipate the word influencer you know like we can't nobody's going to claim that but what we didn't say the individual's voice is going to be able to rise and when you have one person who has 150 million followers and then you have the president of the United States at 25 million followers ah, that's kind of telling you something that this technology has changed the world. You know, they, but it's it, it was it was also more than that. You know, it was bringing people together, right? So the the online communities. We were a huge. There was a huge movement back in the '90s that, um, and it was it was spearheaded by the company called the Globe, um, and we all thought that online communities was going to happen. Now the Globe went down. And so everybody, I remember article after article was saying, this was stupid, online communities are dumb, they're never going to work. And more, I was in, in, I was in Silicon Valley in 2000 when the crash happened. I remember my commute went from an hour and 15 minutes to 40 minutes within six months. That's how many people, the visitors went home. Really? Right? Yeah, and then, like so, crypto winter and that are so striking to me, uh, because at, at the North American Bitcoin conference, you know, you and I were both at you know, last year. They were like, when it was, the attendance was down tremendously. We were but, in a small basement room. We weren't even in the main room like we were two years ago during the bull market. I said we got bombed back three years. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> we kind of like, whoa, what, we just got one time warp. So. Um, <sighs> Yeah, so you, you said you said earlier that you libertarian, uh, that word gets thrown around a lot. Um, were you were you always did you grow up with like, you know, grandparents or parents um, like any any stories that you remember of growing up that kind of set your mind in that? You know, why are we trusting a, a government or centralized party with our, with our fate? What gives what gives, you know, centralized parties the right to tell us what mistakes we shouldn't make? 
No, actually, you know what? It was, uh, yeah, I come from a very entrepreneurial family. So we're very much believers of, you don't, you don't rely on the state. You eat what, you know, you, you eat what you kill. You rely on eat yourself. What you, kill. you know, it's like, that's just my mindset. I, you know, um, I, and so, no, what happened was I, I got um, exposed to, I, I did some uh, research in college on economic theory. And I remember looking at some stuff where, uh, I, I read a lot of Anne Rand's um, books um, and articles. Uh, one article in particular that really like woke me up was an Alan Greenspan article that he wrote um, for Anne Rand that that said that um, taxes that, that inflation is insidious tax on uh, the citizens and gold is the protector of the citizens. Meanwhile, then this guy becomes the head of the Federal Reserve, and now he's part of the establishment. Best friends with Alan Greenspan. Yeah, I mean, so it's it's like... He trickled in economics. But ironically, he was a libertarian, you know, like hardcore. And and I, I you know maybe he still is at heart I don't know maybe whatever his case was but what that what that opened my mind to was this is not real what's happening here there's 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 something behind the scenes that we're not seeing um, that started that started becoming evident then I then I got involved for like the next twenty years I was heavily involved in the gold market so where did you where did you grow up so I grew up in uh, New York so it was uh, Which part? New York. Uh, Long Island, uh, okay. area called Great Neck, which is about half an hour. Oh, yeah. I know Great Neck. Uh, and uh, until high school, uh, even though I continued high school here, I actually moved into Manhattan. So I was one of the cool kids that actually got to be around the, in the yellow taxis in Manhattan. Sure. Um, but then I came back to the suburbs to go to school during the day. Um, and uh, then, but then I left. I left for like the next, you know, 17 years or so. I moved down. Uh, and that was very helpful because I lived around the whole country. I lived in, in Washington, D.C., so I got to really, I went to school there, so I got to see the political establishment. And that only hardened my libertarian beliefs. It made me more skeptical. Um, and then uh, eventually I found my way after I went to law school. Then I did like a, a postdoctorate in, in law. And then I moved over to Silicon Valley. And as soon as the Internet boom, I was just like literally it was a magnet and I was metal. <clears throat> the, 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 the things that like you know, were fascinating to me, though. But, you know, I, I want to make a clear distinction, though. Like, a lot of people throw around this word libertarian, you know, like, so... What I don't do like mean? labels either. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I say that just because it's harder to, you know, but maybe it's easier to explain what I mean by that. You know, I'm not an anarchist. You know, I think government has a really important role. I think we'll all, you know, we'll... we'll to, to, delve into civil war if we don't have the government. I think the government's role should be more limited, you know, and I think especially when it comes to monetary policy, the way that it's happening and, you know, when, when the thing that really is shocking to me is that we've had like three massive technology revolutions, you know, over the last hundred plus years and, you know, starting from the industrial age. And if you, and if you map like, you know, actual earnings for people, uh, they're not, you know, and productivity and all of that. The, you know, the productivity is like off the charts, but actually, what one earner could do on a full time job today, two people working more hours cannot do. You know, that doesn't make sense. I mean, you so should, productivity has gone up or down. You think human beings? <sighs> productivity has gone through the roof. I mean, if you look at it, it's 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 a it's a it's a unicorn chart, hockey stick, right? I mean, for the last hundred years, um, and you know, you had the technology revolution, then you had the microprocessor revolution. The human beings are getting more efficient at doing things. Yeah, the problem. Yeah, and the problem with that is that we're as the citizens are not benefiting from that because why not? Inflation and printing money. You know, I mean, taxes are taxes. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm not against taxes, but in just printing money, the way that they're printing it um, is, uh, and there's no check on it. That's the problem. You're right. Debasement of a currency is bad, especially when it goes out of hand. You look at Venezuela, Argentina. You look at even um, in the eurozone. You look at Zimbabwe. You look at all these places where the government <clears throat> prints more money to do whatever they want, and and our government does it too. Um, to a lesser extent, uh, in a negative way, or at least in a, in a negative way that we can see right now. 
But you're right. Um, we debase our currency, and it makes the value of the dollars in our pocket worth a lot less. So what yeah, you're I saying is that human beings were becoming were, – were, were, were more productive, were more efficient. The amount of energy that it takes to do something, to grow food, or the amount of energy it takes to live – or survive and to prosper is a lot less. However, because of manipulation and and printing more money in debasement of the currency, we're losing out. Yeah, and I, I, I would just say I'd argue I'm not so sure that we are as quantitatively better than the Argentinas in the '90s and you know the Zimbabwe's or whatever. You know, I mean, sure, we're not exactly that bad, but. It's masking how bad the United States is simply because it's the world's reserve currency. It can get away with things that a currency, every other currency just can't do. And, and what we end up doing is we end up exporting our inflation. You know, we basically blew up Japan. You know, my, 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 my thesis is the next one we're exporting are these inflated dollars to China China's in this massive bubble, in my opinion, even though there's a lot of good stuff going on, there's a massive bubble. And I think there's going to be a huge pop to that bubble. What does that look like? That looks like, uh, you know, they could be looking at a long term, you know, lack of growth. You know, these $250 million apartments in Hong Kong might drop down to $50 million. Uh, you know, you're going to see their global purchasing power drop. And at some point, all that inflation comes home. Because when they say, if, if at some point any of these guys sell treasuries, now the, 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 the check on that as a country is we have the U.S. military. Right. So, you know, it's, it's unlikely that anybody's going to do that. And, and then we're also the biggest consumers in the world. So it's a more complex conversation. I, I actually have, a, you know, my thesis is we have one more one more area to blow up, and that's called India. So we've got another billion plus people that we can use to export inflation. So I, I got this illusion. What do you mean by that export inflation? Well, what we're doing is we're printing more dollars. Um, but we're buying things uh, from other countries and we target one country in particular, have a huge relationship. Japan was for a while. Now it's China. I believe India is the next one on the road, and even maybe Africa, actually. Um, and so we're pumping dollars into that economy and that economy is flush with dollars. So it causes the assets in that economy to go up exponentially beyond any real value that they should be. China has been a miracle. I admit that. But the prices of, let's say, real estate in China, just like are, are not in line. It's with crazy. The miracle. Sure. Well, I mean, if you look at the Imperial Palace in the 90s, it was worth, I think, more than all of California. Like that, like obviously could not have made sense, you know, and then they were buying, you know, Rockefeller Center and everything, you know, the, the Japanese. And now you're seeing this whole thing play out all over again. So, you know, there's parallels, you're seeing the parallels, and I got disillusioned with the whole thing, because I'm like, wait a minute, right, this, is, this is a Ponzi scheme. And ultimately what it comes down to is fiat currency. I don't know why people, like, I guess the masses is easy to, you know, fool, but fiat currency is literally nothing more than like a lark experiment. No, I don't think the creators of fiat, you know, back, you know, 100 years ago, ever- Money is just a shared illusion. It's a complete, it's, yeah, it's completely, you know, and, and it's, there's a military that backs it up, right? But I don't think anybody anticipated it lasting this long. And as much as I thought that it was going to implode, now I'm of the belief that these guys may be able to keep, you know, the musical chairs going a lot longer. You know, of course, you have one shock that's, you know, a black swan event that might change everything. Um, and that's why Bitcoin, in my opinion, is so like if anybody doesn't have some Bitcoin or something, you know, you know, comparable to that. You Owning know, just a few stocks. Bitcoins, you know, people say that I need to own. You don't honestly, if you own a little bit of Bitcoin, a little bit of some other cryptos, then it's a hedge against whatever comes next. But so so you just described a big problem. And I think every day more and more people are waking up to what that problem is. However, is is Bitcoin or for crypto for that matter, whatever the crypto is, is, the, is that the solution? And what I mean by that, for 
we have the dollar as like a global reserve currency and most important things in the world today are priced in dollars. You go, you want to buy a company based in Thailand, they're going to price their company in dollars. Most things in the world today, you know, luxury apartments around the world, it's priced in dollars and then it's the relative local currency to whatever to whatever the, the dollar price is. But in the absence of something else, will the dollar lose its reserve currency? And then is Bitcoin that something else? No, I think Bitcoin is actually part of a broader trend. So okay. the dollar, I think... That's it, a good it, answer. It's, you know, the dollar, I anticipate, you know, at least looking out in the next few decades, is going to stay the world's reserve currency. But unlike, let's say, from the fall of the Soviet Union until around the last 10 years or five years, it was the sole currency. It, we were the sole superpower, and that was like it, right? There wasn't anybody to challenge us. I think Other countries was, even base their currency off our – even <sighs> just use dollars. They peg it to the dollar. They use – I mean, I can go – I just came back from – Prague, then I went to Paris, and then I went to Tel Aviv. I use dollars in all three of those with no problem whatsoever. And there's no other. And by the way, I use Bitcoin too. I, in Prague, I used Bitcoin, and they were it was very easy to use Bitcoin. Um, not everywhere, but for several places, did take Bitcoin. So that was that was kind of cool. Um, and, and what I think you're going to see is the U.S. as a whole, but in particular the, the U.S. dollar, instead of it being unparalleled, it's going to become first amongst equals. So the yuan, the yen, um, po possibly even the Russian ruble, you know, they're, they're a dark horse in there. And most importantly to us, Bitcoin. So I don't think Bitcoin takes over the world reserve. Um, I, I certainly envision a world where Bitcoin's got a, you know, I don't think it becomes a serious contender until it's like a today's dollars, call it 20, 20 trillion or more. You know, it's, it's just too small to be relevant right now. Um, but it becomes an alternative, right? And so there, that alternative is somewhat of a check on the other fiats, you know, but that's not going to replace. Um, and then the other fiats, I think, are going crypto too. That's another counter trend that's happening at the same time. What do you mean by that? So I think, like stable you know, coins? what? Like stable yeah. coins? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> stable is a very uh, tricky word to use when you're referring to a fiat currency. <laughs> stable relative to what? Relative, yeah. <laughs> relative to itself, maybe, but nothing else. Um, it, so, yeah, I mean, look, I think, you know, it, it, it dawned on me like, like pretty early on. I was like, oh, Jesus, this is, you know, when I when I saw, you know, freedom and new monetary policy and, you know, Bitcoin's like these ink spots, the Rorschach tests, like everybody sees something different in it. Right. And, and everybody's right. Um, but what I what I, I realized early on um, is that the, the governments are actually can use this technology and turn it around on us and entrap us a lot more in the near term. Well, it's actually the, the, you. Let's uh, blockchain a government own, you know, government controlled, permissioned blockchain, where where the U.S. dollar is phased out as a digital and physical currency, and a crypto version is phased in. Now they basically. Every and you know there'll be some period of time when they say okay it's a moratorium you know we've got five years or whatever it is bring in all your dollars and so all the drug lords and everybody that have hundreds of millions they're kind of you know they're, they're out of luck but you know everybody else turns in their money and it's, you know this happened with gold let's not forget this is there's, there's a precedent for this you know you you went into your safety deposit box and a police officer had to come in with you you know they confiscated all the gold and then. And then they did what they did with it, which is obviously, you know, pretty insidious. And I think they're going to do the same thing here. They'll confiscate, you know, not in like a state, you know, horrible way, but I think they're just going to say we're moving to a crypto dollar. And so they're going to take out all the benefits. And, and, and I think they're actually going to say this is helpful to combat terrorism. It's going to be so ironic. You know, wait, you'll see the headline. Well, you know, they're not going to use it with crypto, obviously. They're going to use something else. But we know they're going to use the arguments that they use against Bitcoin for having a crypto dollar. 
and what because now we can track and we're going after terrorists and uh, now we can but, but really you know and tax evasion but really what are they doing they know every goddamn transaction you've done from a pack of bubble gum to buying a house it all goes through the blockchain you don't even need to a blockchain pay. that they control so yeah it's massive control you know so- and- what you're describing is essentially the war on cash, as as it's been colloquially termed. Yeah, I think that's game over. I mean, this is inevitable. Now, and, and, and so for people who are like getting really down, I mean, it's it's to me, it's an interim step. And and what I mean by that, I think when Bitcoin came, like a crack in the marble happened. And uh, that crack is slowly going longer and longer. And at the end of the day, it's going to go all the way across to the end. And, and by that, I mean, I see a world where we have really a real decentralized government. You know, like we're, I think it's setting off emotion. But I don't know if, you know, it's going to probably get worse before we see that utopian future. That could be 50 years. It could be 300 years. I really don't know. Um, but in the interim, you know, to the extent that governments can use this tool to gain more control and more power, um, they're going to do that. So what was the first thing you did when you got involved in the crypto space? I bought Bitcoin. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that you was... ran down the block to your local corner store and you bought some Bitcoin. You want to know, actually, it was the most bizarre experience of my life. Uh, I, I could I couldn't I couldn't figure out how to buy Bitcoin. Right? There wasn't anywhere, you know. It was this. I think it was. I think, I think it, was, it was local Bitcoins at the time. And I got in touch with this guy, and he said, "Meet me at this place." And it was like midnight. We were. It was by a train station. So I went to the bank, and I withdrew my hard-earned tax, after-tax money, I took, you know, it was like a few thousand dollars, and I went and I met this guy, and he's sitting in the car in the back seat. There's a guy with a gun pointing at me. No. He had a knife in his pocket, and I'm like, I'm kind of like, I, you know, I said, well, if I'm gone, I'm gone here. But it actually turned out he zapped his Bitcoin. I mean, I didn't expect that getting into the car. Don't mind, mind you. We had a conversation outside. It was all cool. I thought everything. Then we got in. That happened. So I thought maybe I was getting robbed. But no, actually, what happened was they had been robbed before. What was he? He was cleaning his gun or something. Yeah, no, he had been robbed before in trying to sell Bitcoin. So he was actually protecting himself. I, I turned out becoming really good friends with this guy. He gave me the Bitcoin. I gave oh. him the cash. But it was just kind of funny that you're trying to buy something and it looked like we were doing, you know, a drug deal and it was a totally legitimate transaction. If, All if, if, if a police officer came up to that, to that, oh, yeah. car, right, then you'd all be in cuffs. I don't know how I would have explained that, but it was so legitimate. Like, no, officer, um, he's really cool. I promise. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, it was. <laughs> I was just saying it was, that was their attorney. Um, they were actually really cool. <laughs> you could have said that. <laughs> They, they were one of them was a, was a was a I would say a B rate movie actor. He was in a, a, a blockbuster movie at the time. You know, he had a lesser role in it. But like these were not like some thugs on a street. The other guy was a cryptographer. I mean, like these were guys that were like really smart guys. Um, so it was, and by the way, that's one of the things that really captured me about this industry. You know, someone it, was holding a gun to you. That's a B B movie actor. Yeah, that did too. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What captured you? What, no, what captured me was, you know, um, when I was in Silicon Valley in the 90s and the early 2000s, I was always shocked about how much Mensa energy was around me. I mean, it was always like just wow. Sure. Right? And then uh, I entered blockchain, and especially in, I mean, it's obviously gotten more, but in the early years, there weren't. Um, very many dummies around, right? It was like, it's not easy to understand. Forget about the cryptography and the mathematics and all of the other texts, you know, sciences, why, you know, it's so hard to be Satoshi because you needed to be like this Renaissance person. But it was uh, to grasp decentralization as a concept is still difficult for people. You know, people had a hard time with B2C e-commerce. Now I was trying to get decentralization. But what, what was really the shocker was, I've never in my life 
and I've been around a lot of different tech environments, seen this many smart people so dedicated um, to, and that's when I stopped saying a uh, technology. You're flattering me right now. What? You're flattering me right now. Yeah, well, you were, <laughs> it, it was a movement. It was a movement. You know, I think what you're I, trying to explain is that people like us saw what other people couldn't see. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, it's, it was it was a combination of luck. You know, somebody luckily showed luck. me that white paper, right? And life, you know, I, I always I always remind myself any good fortune I had. Yeah, uh, but you could have read it and then like say this is a yes. cool. Yeah, have a nice day. Give me my coffee. But 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 a lot of really you know but you know what it wasn't just being smart you needed another thing because a lot of really 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 smart people blew it off what it was it was smart but you had a certain angle on life and you had a certain angle on um, economics certain angle on technology and all of this like you know get put into a stew you know and we all had a little bit of a different formula but these various formulas are what allowed us to recognize you know that there's something magical and and paradigm shifting here you know and, and it was a really small group i mean you know i you and me back in the day and you know before 2013 I know some groups I'm in, I'm in actually a number of groups where they pretty much all but ban anybody before 2014. And not from an arrogance standpoint, they just don't trust that you weren't in it only for the money if you came in after that. Because if you came in before 2014, like like we did, there was no money to be made. <laughs> I mean, this is what there was, you know, we could try a little bit here and there, but there was no- No, there was no money. It wasn't <laughs> Lambos. It was, uh, can Bitcoin buy me a new hard drive or something? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I just mind, I remember guys telling me that they just mined 10,000 Bitcoin and, you know, and it was like, you know, $4,000. I mean, I, you know, it was like, it was a joke and they were so, so you, proud of it. So you bought some Bitcoin, you're, you're hanging out in groups, you're reading message boards and forums and you're getting to know some people. What did you do next? So next, um, I, I got really interested in the tech. I got really, really, like I started reading as much about it as I could. Um, I'm not a coder, I'm not a developer, but I've run, you know, I've been around the, the several dozen of them and, and they've reported You've to me. You've been around it enough to be able to understand what, what you're looking at if you look at a few to lines of code. To dangerous to myself, I'd say, is probably a good way to put it. But yeah, <laughs> it was, um, so I was looking at it from that perspective and I was kind of trying to see what are the implications of this? Um, and that was about a, you know, for the call that from 2011 to end of 2013, uh, I was going to a lot of meetups. Um, that that was for sure. Um, but, but there weren't a lot of meetups to go to. So uh, there was one in New York that had, I don't know, maybe two dozen people at peak. And that I think was the largest in the world. Um, and then in 2014, late 2013, it was November, um, so a guy I worked with, drops another bomb on my lap and it was like two days after Vitalik put out the white paper on Ethereum and I started reading this thing and I, I sat back and I talked to a couple of guys that were reading it too and I just and I remember I said to him I said this sounds like an operating system and that was a like and I knew who Vitalik, I don't know Vitalik personally but I was very respect I had a lot of respect for him because he was writing for Bitcoin magazine um, and so we all we all knew who he was. So he wasn't an, an unknown. Entity. That's what people don't remember. Vitalik got his start actually writing for uh, just Bitcoin Magazine, which is still around today. That's right. Absolutely for uh, for Mihai. So um, who's another? I think you know pioneer. You know he's a clear pioneer in sure. this space. And Vitalik, I actually thought was the best writer in the space. And you, you actually even saw his writing get better and better. I had no clue about how brilliant he was, how deep he could go like that. Sure, he wasn't always in the same circles. And I just thought he was some some kid that was a good, decent writer. And he's good at Skyping you and asking you questions on the story. Yeah, 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 and we all hung out in the same Skype rooms and stuff. And like yeah, it wasn't even a big deal. Uh -huh. I'm still in some of those Skype rooms. There's nobody comes yeah, in. Yeah, me too. I just checked. <laughs> I'm literally uh, in some of these Skype rooms where Vitalik, I think, is still in these rooms. 
<laughs> oh, that's too funny. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, anyway, so I, I, I went. I was headed down to the Miami conference, and I uh, two of the guys that worked me. By the way, I was running an artificial intelligence company uh, in machine vision. Um, I'm that was my passion at the time. I was loving life. I, I'm the author of two dozen um, patents, in, mostly in machine vision and autonomous vehicles. Uh, author or co-author, I should say. Um, and so I was loving life and enjoying myself and happily going along, enjoying this little side hobby of Bitcoin. But then this bombshell comes on me. I'm like, we got to go. I, I hear everybody's converging in Miami. Um, I, I got me and two of the guys that worked for me. Last minute, I had a family emergency. I ended up not going. But my two guys went down and they called me from there and they're like hey look these guys want to do a crowd sale but they have no idea how to do it legally i told them my boss can help you can you help um and so that term crowd sale has had never been done before like it's a, it was a new term didn't exist in the crypto space yet ico creating a token then selling it didn't exist can you tell us about how that came to be and how you came up with 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 the idea and the terms for that yeah so i mean there were a f like i think two or three crowd sales um i think mastercoin was the first one uh where you had some you know really big folks behind that one um and but what that what they were doing is they just sold a token there was no legal basis behind it and, and it showed that there was actually a, a, um, interest in it the, the question was that you know, was that just a sale of a security you know, so what the, what I, I I met with the whole team, the founders and everybody, um, and in particular Vitalik, and and just you know they, they, they said, can you figure out? Uh, it was kind of a funny moment, but I, they said, can you figure out how to do this legally? We've talked to lawyers. They even had the former SC, chairman of the SEC. Somehow they got him, um, and they're all telling us there's no way to do this. It's an illegal sale of securities. And I looked at them and I was so passionate at that point about what, you know, Vitalik was trying to do. I had met him at a point, but frankly, the kid just captured me. I'm like, this kid is like trying to like make the world a better place. I saw he wasn't like some, you know, no offense, but I mean, he didn't strike me as a Mark Zuckerberg. You know, he, he struck me as somebody who was really just trying to make the sure. world a better place. Um, uh, and his actions all have like been very consistent with that even to this day. And I said to them, I guarantee, I looked at them and I said, I guarantee you, I, I will figure this out. And they're like, really, how? And I said, I have no bleeping idea. So I think at that point, they thought I was a little bit crazy. Um, but it was, you know, I'm, I'm just the kind of person, if I put my mind something. I think everyone's a little bit crazy, to be honest, in this story. You gotta be crazy to be <laughs> like no normal person would enter into this. So what was it like? Vital Vitalik was just like sweeping, you know, like the floor, and and everyone was just like, uh, he was ordinary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he was not. I mean, he was, you know, we were, you know, he, I, I was, he would stay with me when he came to New York. Uh, we didn't want to have any, you know, nexus with the U with the. Uh, the U.S., so I rented an office for Ethereum right next to my artificial intelligence company. Like we had know. lobster once. Me, you, Vitalik, yeah. and a few other people. Do you remember that? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but back in the day, you came there. That's right. Absolutely. I was uh, there. I met, like, you know, that those 2012, especially when we opened up the Ethereum office there, was that became our New York headquarters. And I had the good fortune of meeting, you know, so many amazing people, you know, that ended up, you know, some left and some like us stayed. Um, and yeah, so I spent the next five months and they were kind of like rabid dogs because people wanted to, I think, take my neck off because they wanted to just go forward. And you I were holding everyone back saying we have to do this the right way. Well, to be fair, Vitalik held everybody back. Um, and also Charles. Charles certainly wanted to do this legally, properly. Uh, and so some of the other guys, uh, nobody was not well-intentioned, but they just wanted to move forward. But they didn't understand the implication. Now I think everybody gets it. Um, and I didn't quite uh, appreciate. I figured, look, I'm, in, you know, I'm innovative. I'm smart. I'm going to figure this out. And then once I really got into the weeds, I'm like, oh my god, nobody's ever done something like this and not been a security. The law. I read hundreds of articles. You know, I went through all of the SEC the regs. I talked to several dozen attorneys, and they all said not a shot. 
Um, and then there was a chance to kind of, you know, counter that we had, uh, mostly with me and Metallic, that, that, you know, gave birth to the, the invention of it. What was the, I guess, eureka moment for you that you it, it kind of figured out? It literally was that. In fact, Vitalik and I were, were, were doing this documentary on Ethereum and mostly on Ethereum and, 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 and some of the other aspects of the industry. And, and we literally, you know, I said to him, I said, do you remember exactly what happened? He goes, oh, I remember exactly. And we reenacted it on screen. Well, um, so tell me, tell me what happened. Like, so what happened was, um, I mean, it's... It, it, it's only in hindsight that it seemed that it turned out to be a big deal. We, I had no clue. Um, I said, you know, I was talking to him. I was still trying to get my hands around the concept of gas. And I was like, so I said, hey, you need this stuff to send this stuff, right? And he's like, you mean you know, the ether? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's you like, need yeah. ether to send ether. Right, exactly. And I said, well, so it's kind of like gas you know, that you're going to be put in your car. And by definition, everybody who contributes to the crowd sale will be a user of the system, you know, even if they have to send it one time. Um, so it, and so now, now what we had was we had utility. I, mean, I didn't call utility, I called it functionality. There's more okay, to func the analysis, Functionality, but, I like that word. Yeah, I mean, to me, I was calling it a functional token. I mean, somebody overruled me at some point in history and decided to call it a utility token, but I called it a function. It has a better ring. Yeah, that's that. I just said that, I mean, it has some functionality, um, and in this case, it was you know gassing to go, um, and uh, there was it, in Ethereum's case, it was a unique situation where everybody, even if you were selling it, you had to send it to somebody. You had to use Ether. So everybody was, by definition, you know, a user. It's kind of like if you're on the subway, you bought a bunch of tokens. And I said to you, the only way you could sell these tokens, you can keep them if you want. But if you want to sell them, you have to go at least one stop. You use the token and go one stop on the subway. Um, and so you will be a user of the tokens. Um, and so the analysis is, it was, was more involved than that. Um, but that was kind of like the base level analysis. Um, it makes sense. I, uh, and... He's like, yeah, 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 I think that works. And I thought, I, frankly, I thought it was like little, hey, you know, little wacko um, that I didn't think it would pass muster. Um, and I called the former chairman of the SEC that we were talking to, explained it to him. And, I and he's said, like, yeah, I guess I got it. No problem. Have a nice day. I started off the conversation <laughs> with this might be the stupidest thing you've ever heard. <laughs> But if you don't mind, can I just run something by you? And I said, "Don't we have this that. thing called Ethereum?" Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I taught, he already knew about it. And he was uh, kind of captured by Ethereum, um, and and he knew I was trying to do this. And he was just giving me some guidance and saying, you know, and I, and I, so I explained to him functionality and what if we say this is a good? It could be a piece of code, but it has a functional component to it, and we're selling this piece of good, and it's a future sale. It's a sale of a future good, but we're delivering it right away. Um, and when I said that to him, I kind of braced myself, but he turned around and he says, "I think that's brilliant. That actually could, you know, something along the lines of thread the needle or something." I was shocked. Um, but long story short, was I ended up putting together. I worked with. with a, major law firm um, and I helped author, I authored with, with the law firm an opinion that this was more likely than not a security which allowed us to go forward um, and I think that's one of the things that but the, but the basic concept that legal construct is what people then copied and pasted a thousand times two thousand five thousand times um, and in my opinion, and I've been, I was very vocal with this at the peak, at the peak of the bull market, um, people were abusing the hell out of it. They were using my legal analysis to actually sell a security. I did not believe Ether was a security, and I don't believe Ether was a, has ever been a security. Um, so yeah, they use that to abuse it very much. So which is so the, the, the 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 definition of the word functionality is the quality of being suited to serve a purpose well, practically, or practicality, practicality, sorry. And the definition of utility is the state of being useful, profitable, or beneficial. Do you think that utility is a better word than functionality? Because I kind of like, 
I feel like functional token is better than utility token. So do I. That's why I used it. <laughs> but, yeah, because <laughs> um, I feel like functional to- functional functional token implies like functionality almost now, or you need it. You need it. You know, to, exactly. to make it what? That's exactly right. I mean, it, it has to have a function. So it's and it's specifically suited to serve a purpose well. Um, you know, utility does not. It's, this it's much more getting at the heart of the matter. And I don't know whether or not you, the fact that we use the word utility that didn't make that made the argument a little less, you know, um, strong. You know, functionality would have made it a little bit more piercing, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I, I I don't know how that word ever got in there. <laughs> I wish we could go back and change it. Yeah, I mean, but we are where we are right now, and you know, it's the, the trains left the station. Um, you know, somewhere around. So, yeah. so you got involved in that. That blew up, obviously. So many projects, um, and we all know where Ethereum went today. And it's you know, um, the the number two, and it's the it's probably one of the the most important um, cryptocurrency or decentralized projects to to come out after after Bitcoin was essentially launched. And then you ended up starting um, Alchemist Labs. And Alchemist Labs, from what I understand, you're a technology incubator. You've partnered with Techstars, which is one of the largest incubators in the world. So you didn't, you didn't, you didn't have like a one and done. You didn't, you know, be involved in something great and then just enjoyed your spoils. You, you wanted to keep going. No, I mean that was like, um, you know. <laughs> so, sorry for the analogy, but it was like crypto crack. I mean, I had uh, <laughs> it was, to me, it was like when that, you had that taste, you know. And, and for you know, Ethereum, I was an advisor, legal architect, and great. And you know, I had my very specific role. But now I saw this new world. And to me, Bitcoin and Ethereum are two different. We serve different purposes and both game changers. You know, to me, Bitcoin is a store of value and potentially if it gets big enough, could be a real currency. Uh, to me, Ethereum, for lack of a better term, but just put it colloquially, is an operating system. You know, I, I, they're, and, and, they're, and they're both just have this ancestral roots to this guy or people named Satoshi you know, and this underlying technology. But they went in very different directions. They serve very different purposes. I don't really view Ether as a currency. I don't think it really is a currency. Um, uh, but I, I, and I don't, I don't really what is it? it as a value. It's gas. Um, I, I view it as a, I, yeah, exactly. I think Ether is a functional um uh, a piece of code that, that allows you to um, utilize um, a, a DAP, a smart contract. Um, so it's basically the coal that's going into the furnace. You know, so I guess, yeah, I guess you could say coal could coal be a store of value, I guess. It's, you know, but it's just like it's not, well, it's not well suited for that. Uh, and, and Bitcoin, on the other hand, is, is a totally different animal. Bitcoin is like, brilliantly designed for a store of value and i in my opinion satoshi didn't intend for more than that um and, and that was beautiful about it and and i th- if, if i'm not mistaken the irony to all of this was uh i remember at the time hearing um through circles that metallic tried to put ethereum on bitcoin and they the well, I think the words came back as we don't want to pollute our protocol. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. I remember reading about that um, as it was happening. Um, yeah. Vitalik posted in, in, in the Bitcoin forums and, you know, he's, he wanted to put Ethereum on the Bitcoin blockchain before he actually found that Ethereum. And a lot of um, Bitcoin maximalists don't realize this. But, yeah, Ethereum was originally... Tried he tried to put it on Bitcoin blockchain because Vitalik was, you know, for lack of a better term, he was like some sort, some some way of a Bitcoin maximalist, right? Oh, and hundred percent, hundred percent, and he and the Bitcoin community um, said it was a really stupid idea and and kind of put him down for it and didn't want him to do it and said it was going to be polluting and it was going to be spam. It's the same people who said that digital apps on top of Bitcoin is is stupid too. 
those same people said things like Satoshi Dice was spam and it's stupid. But it's these <laughs> it's these apps that bring in people. Uh, yeah. Without those people, then this thing that you're doing is is a waste of time and it's worthless because you need people. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember watching Satoshi Dice and I'm like, this damn thing is addictive. <laughs> I can't think of anything stupider but brilliant, right? I mean, it was just like a lowest common denominator. But, you know, all of us were like, oh, wow, like mesmerized on the screen. Um, and Yeah, no, but I mean, in Vitalik, actually, I remember asking him before we launched, but it was after the crowd. So I said, so... Uh, and I had Bitcoin at the time, and I, you know, I said, "Well, what would you do you know, in terms of? You say, would you sell all your Bitcoin and just put it in Ether?" And he said, "No, no, 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 no. I would put um, half of my money in Bitcoin and half of it in Ether. So because we are still an experiment, but Bitcoin is time tested. You know, this is 2014, right? Um, yeah. And, I mean, the great thing about that guy is he never talks his book." He sees great tech. He says it. You know, it's it's not about what his book is. Um, but then, I, I mean, the other question is like. Then I went on. I started Alchemist, uh, and we did a few dozen, you know, other projects, both protocols and DApps. Um, you know, a lot of the you know big names out there. Um, and uh, the next around 2017, I realized that. I was very uncomfortable with what was happening, you know, because I was so attuned to the securities, non-security analysis. Um, I realized that there was a lot of abuses going on. I wasn't even f- focused on the fraud that was going on because I saw that, and that was was obvious to everybody that there was fraud, some fraud. You know, the BitConnect. I mean, like, who didn't see that, right? Um, but the I was talking more about people abusing the legal construct, um, and that's why I got really interested in security tokens. Um, got involved in uh, advising Polymath. And the, the big one that I did was I structured and um, arranged a T0. Uh, so that's that was and that, that was kind of like the seminal security token sale. Uh, so, so here we go from Bitcoin. And then we go to Ethereum, which is the, you know, the, the utility or functionality token. I like functionality better. And T0 was the the pioneer of doing this concept called security token. And I feel like security token was lambasted more than even the idea of a utility token. People look down on the concept of, of utility token. Uh, sorry. People look down on the concept of security token a lot more, right? Oh, you see, both of them had a very similar um, uh, environment that I find great technologies always have. They have this core group of cult, I wouldn't even say cult-like figures, it's a cult, core group of cult people that 100%, you know, they're, it's, they're, they're literally all in on this, you know, there's no going back, and it's a one-way trip for them, and so they had that with Ethereum, um, and you had that with security tokens. But then that was a small circle. Then you had this massive circle of the rest of the world that were looking at them and being like, you're idiots, you're fools, this is dumb, this isn't going to work. And in Ethereum's case, it was, you know, in some case, the maximalists, in some case, regular tech people. I mean, we, the, the ratio of believers to non-believers is like, one, two, and add a lot of zeros to the other side of the ratio. You know, it was a very small group of people, but a very dedicated group. You know, kind of like when you see a rebellion in a country of a small group, you know, like it's, that's how it starts. And you see that with all great technologies. And the internet was no different. And so, um, and frankly, social media was no different. You know, I really thought social media was a joke. Uh, what do you mean? Well, I mean, when, when I talk about the globe, but then... What you had was you had Friendster, which re-energized and like, all right, we got this. And then Friendster literally collapsed upon itself and everybody walked away. You know, I know I know people that invested in Friendster and then Zuckerberg approached them and said, would you invest in here at some like ridiculous, like, I'm, I'm, it was like almost a nothing valuation. And they said, nah, this, this, whatever they were calling social media at the time, they said, it doesn't work. I've already lost enough money. It's, it's, it's a losing um, model. Um, and so they, that's, that's so nobody would have ever anticipated Instagram and Snapchat. and Kim Kardashian. 
And then, yeah, so then that gave rise to the individual celebrity. Um, you know, the, the, the one too many just is what is so amazing. And the many to one back, you know, in terms of comments and things. But the one to many is you just didn't have that before. And, and the, the cool thing is that it, was, it, it gave people without having to go through an institution or anything else to do that. I think decentralization is going to speed up that one to many process um, and, and add more on top, on top of that. But going to the security tokens, uh, you know, when I saw that, I, you know, I, I realized that if you look at all the assets in the world that are not liquid, and then all the assets in the world that never even are, people aren't even thinking about them as assets that could be utilized. I think intellectual property and other things, right? You know, they're not really. So you are know, you, are you more of a fan of securitizing physical assets or? Securitizing intellectual assets. Um, the intellectual assets are intellectually more stimulating. So I mean, it's like yeah, it's a good point. It's, 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 you know, it's 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 a more you know from somebody. I, I my my original practice. I'm a uh, structured finance and tax attorney. Um, and so, uh, and I was working on, you know, multi-billion dollar structure finance deals on Wall Street. And so th that kind of stuff, you know, structuring it and, and figuring out how to make it work and everything. And, and that's, by the way, that's what served me well with Ethereum, served me well with T0 and all the ones in between. You know, I, I built this, you know, uh, you know structuring tokens to me was also, you know, I looked at tokens and I felt like tranches you know, when I was structuring deals before. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, mean, yeah I, I would say this, you know, if, you're, if you came to me and you said, all right, we want to tokenize lumber. And, and in fact, a guy did do this to me. A, a guy came to me who was one of the largest, uh, maybe the largest art expert and dealer in the world. And he said, we want to tokenize art. And I sat there for two that hours. That makes sense, though. A hundred percent, it makes sense. It's an, it's an, I mean, I think the you know, $60 billion, whatever art market could turn into you know, a trillion because it's the currency of the rich, right? So, you know, it's, it's real estate. It's, another, it's an alternative to real estate for the wealthy. However, after two hours, he's like, I want to hire you. And I said, mm, that's that. You don't need me. He said, what do you mean? And like, like three times he asked me to hire me. And I just said, you don't need me. And, and, and really what it really came down to is it, was, it, was, it wasn't interesting for me. You know, and it wasn't like, it, was no, it wasn't very challenging. I'm not saying that it wasn't challenging at all. It was, you know, but tokenizing, you know, one piece of asset. A little while later, he came to me and he said, you know, we found a way to use decentralization to recreate paint. And I was like, what? Come again? Okay, what? <laughs> Yeah, I was like, what? I'm like, what did you just say? Did you recreate paint, decentralized? And I'm like, all right, you got my attention now. Um, and I won't go into that whole topic, but it was it, it was involving AI and, and NFTs. And it was a super cool thing. My brother-in-law owns a paint company. Can you explain this to him? Because I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a new form of art, really, is what he was doing. He created a whole new genre of art. Um, using decentralization, NFTs, AI. Um, the first one was the centipede that learns to feed itself, um, but in a decentralized manner. So like it could deal with other centipedes. It was, it was a super cool thing. It was a very, you know, it wasn't even an alpha. It was a proof of concept at best. Um, but the point was that that got my attention. So yeah, I mean, if you're in this space, uh, you know, I'll leave to Wall Street the tokenizing of iron and gold and those kinds of things. You know, I'm much more interested in how do we advance this technology? Because look, I mean, if that's not just money. And it's not that it's uninteresting. And, but if you just want to make money, I'm not even sure you should be in this space. Just go to Wall Street and go make money. I'm like, if you're in this space and you're taking the heat of this space and dealing with things like crypto winner and people telling you that you're abating a terrorist, you better be having something interesting coming out of it. And I hope you, know, hope you make a few bucks along the way. So uh, the, the tokenizing, uh, that, that, that trend, what I would say about that trend is it's, it's a third trend. So uh, you've got Satoshi and Bitcoin store of value, maybe a currency if it gets big enough and, and has some stability to it. You've got Ethereum, 
where it's I just call it a, a operating system, you know, uh, iOS or Windows or whatever, in decentralized format. It's, of course, a hundred people are going to say I'm, it's way more deep than that. I agree with all you guys out there. I'm just trying to make, you know keep it you know simple. And then the, you have this third one of uh, using this technology again to tokenize assets. Uh, and that we did. Is that the final? Is that the final thing? Is tokenizing assets? No, 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 no. What's after that? So that, but that, that's a multi quadrillion dollar market. So it's massive, and the wealth that it'll create is massive. The next one is where my partnership, uh, our partnership, where we Alchemist and TechStars got together, and it is. Tech stars for anybody who doesn't know is like the gold standard in accelerators. You know, they have, you know, dozens of them, like fifty of them around the world. You know, Barclays does their fintech one, Amazon does their AI one, and Alchemist does their blockchain franchise. And what those, what our our criteria there is, you must use the you you somehow your underlying technology is blockchain, and that's kind of this fourth revolution. And that's where the plumbing of the world, we're seeing it in fintech first, uh, but where they're changing all their plumbing uh, to um, go to blockchain technology in a whole bunch of, you know, a whole host of different ways. Uh, but that's, we're starting to see that seep out into other um, uh, industries. And the reason we partnered with Techstars was a number of reasons. One, I really wanted to bring more legitimacy to the space. And the, to me, I don't know of a of a of a more broad or better respected brand um, to come into blockchain, and so Techstars coming in was a big stamp of approval uh, that this is real, that they're going to commit resources, and they believe, and they do believe that this could be one of the largest, um, you know, um, create wealth. Uh, technology um, revolutions uh, to date. Um, the, the other reason we, we brought Techstars in is uh, our thesis, and a lot of us have thought this, you know, w w that it was going, it, it the blockchain and this fourth revolution with the plumbing was going to seep into industry. And instead of having two crypto heads that are like, we're taking over healthcare, but we don't even own health insurance. And hey, we know nothing about <laughs> healthcare. <laughs> it's like, we get we have this company uh, you probably saw it when you were there in blima I'm, I'm just using them as you know as a case example like these guys are 30 year industry veterans in healthcare they have contracts and uh, relationships with farm big pharma with insurance companies you know with with governments you know, they have hundreds of thousands and millions of patients and then all somebody showed them hey if you do this in a decentralized format here is all of the amazing things you can do and exponentially increase the, the growth of your business and that was there's uh you know with all due respect to us in crypto it's really hard for us to pull those guys from industry because they're not they're not within us you know like it was easy when it was just a project and all of us were you know all the people that we knew were launching projects but that's not the game anymore the game's changed right now you know there's these in domain experts is what they really are are learning about decentralization and the only way to get to them is to have a brand that transcends blockchain and techstars is that brand you've been a big advocate for um casper labs and casper labs has is led by Vlad, who uh, Vlad Zemfir, who's the one of the uh, early architects and um, developers on Ethereum, and is seen as like Vitalik number two, and um, it's seen as something that could potentially solve all the problems that Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some others couldn't solve. Now, this is a it's a very bold thing to say. Can you explain, you know, why you think that? Yeah, and, and, and I think when history is told, um, the, Vlad's going to go down in history as, you know, if not the, but certainly on par with, you know, the other two folks um, and in Satoshi and Vitalik. And, and so, I mean, uh, here, here's how I would explain it. You know, we've had 
um, two tectonic shifts uh, in um, shakes in, in blockchain. The first one uh, was the Nakamoto consensus. And basically, you know, there's different ways of describing it, but it's kind of like the best copyright protection we've ever seen that, you know, resolved the double spend problem. Um, and that was like you know, revolutionary. Then five years later, you more or less added intelligence to that ledger. Um, and, and then this concept of a world computer, and that was Vitalik. And that was, you know, a tectonic shift of, you know, massive proportion. Now move five years later, and <clears throat> you, uh, what we've realized is none of this stuff scales. Right? And so Vlad really, um, his invention um, is, he has invented the way to scale. And if you look back at history, history um, has been, you know, very, you remember the guy who scales, you know, like, you what does that mean? What does that mean? What's, I mean, Bitcoin scales, what, what, what's, what, what does Casper do that, that Bitcoin and Ethereum don't? Yeah, so no, I, I'd argue that it doesn't scale in a fully decentralized manner. The, the reason Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two biggest chains is because they're, the two, only two, in my opinion, other than, you know, uh, for people that are for them, um, there's only two that are fully decentralized. Uh, and I like to say on the on the path to decentralization, nothing is decentralized yet, but um, at least some of them are on the path to decentralization. Yeah, you know, everybody, the, the, everybody's going to use decentralized in a different way. We're decentralized because we have a hundred billion jillion nodes, right? So we're decentralized, you know. But the first three, no, you know, the, you know, we've got three delegates that just make all the decisions. You know, it's like it's it, it, it kind of the, 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 this Casper, what Vlad invented, is structurally decentralized. That's the key. Right. These other and I'm not knocking anything else because I think many of them are going to be very successful. But when we're talking about a main public chain, um, this is the, what he invented um, is the invention of scalability. If you look back at history, you know, you, the invention of scalability has been the thing that has exploded. Like, look at the car. You know, Henry Ford did not invent the car. Benz invented the car. Henry Ford invented the assembly line that scaled the car. You know, more modern. Oh. Yeah, that's he invented the invention. I see your point. Uh, same thing with the printing press. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and look at more modern examples, right? So look at Friendster that I mentioned earlier. Friendster invented social media and it collapsed because it couldn't scale. Zuckerberg's brilliance was not social media. Zuckerberg's brilliance was figuring out how to scale this to two, three billion people. You know, Yahoo invented search, but it was doing it manually. These two guys from Google came and invented a way to scale search. And these inventors ended up getting trillion dollar um, prizes. But more importantly than that, it, they, they are the ones that got it to the world. Now, and that's neither one's more important. Like, so, you know, the, what, what's it's, it's symmetrical because this is another five years later. But let's 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 give, let's give credit where it's due. You know, this only works because like. He, you know, Vlad is standing on the shoulder of other giants. And in this case, it's Vitalik and Satoshi. So you needed this progression, but that's time where you need to fully, we need to scale. The issue with when I say fully decentralized, um, and I'm talking about, you know, other protocols, if there is, if you, um, he, I, in my opinion, is the first one that did not compromise decentralization in order to scale. And, and scalability, I mean, like Visa-like levels, you know, 1,000 transactions per second, 2,000. And so uh, it, it, these other ones where you have a certain number of delegates and, you know, um, a number of them could collude. Um, and that's the key word, you know, collusion. And censorship is also an, another area. But if, you, if there is a possibility of collusion and reversal of transaction and and value being disappearing and there is on almost every chain then i do my i do not understand how significant value will go on those chains in fact you're seeing that bear out you're seeing chains that are getting a fair amount of adoption and i think they're gonna have huge utility i think there's you know it doesn't mean that they're not gonna be successful i just think a lot of value is gonna end up on those chains 
Uh, you're even seeing the way Wall Street is, is building out with these permission chains. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're doing blockchain. We're going to do our own little private permission chain, and then we'll just hash the data to Ethereum. And I'm like, that's not blockchain. <laughs> like, I don't, it's, blockchain is, in my opinion, you can't be half pregnant because it misses. It, it, and this isn't a philosophical discussion. It doesn't accomplish its goals. Um, and if there's a chance of collusion, either because, you know, let's say there's a number of delegates and then they say, okay, randomization, but somebody has to propose a seed. And that seed, if you can figure out, get, get to the seed, you know, you can hack the system. And I'm using a few different examples, but Vlad's the one who finally figured out. I wanted to ask you, uh, sorry, Vlad was able to finally figure out what? What I what I call the holy grail of the tripart of security on the bottom, let's say on the left is it's a triangle. It's uh, yeah. decentralization, um, security, and scalability, um, and without any sacrificing the other structurally. Now, of course, it still has to be in reality, but structurally is important. My question that I wanted to ask you when you brought up immutability: Do you think? Do you think Ethereum lost its immutability when yeah, yeah. the DAO forked? Yeah, you know, I mean, look, so there is some maximalists, Bitcoin maximalists that say Ethereum is a permission chain. You know, I mean, well, what they what they say is what they say is Ethereum lost its immutability when it when it forked to bail out. It basically reversed its chain. However, it reversed its chain. And, you know, blockchains are supposed to be irreversible, censorship resistant, unfreeze, you know, unfreezable. And Ethereum did these things a few years ago during a very big uh, hack of, of a smart contract. But the other argument is that, no, Ethereum didn't lose its immutability because the consensus of miners actually agreed to the hard fork. And if a consensus agreed to doing a hard fork then it's not losing its immutability. It's following the course of a blockchain. Yeah, I think the, the issue, yeah, you know, I, you, the arguments are super valid. I think the problem in that case is you had this um, uh, demigod uh, in Vitalik uh, for Ethereum that they're pointing to and they're saying he did it. Well, that's not true. He didn't. You're absolutely right. The consensus was, uh, I would guess his consensus, his judgment was probably lower than the consensus. And he has never shown an, uh, um, a propensity to guide unless, you know, he, he'll put, he put things out there. But he's, he's always trying to take the read of the community. Um, and, and with the parody hack, if you notice, um, they, they, they did, you know, take a vote. And I think it was like 55, 45 or something, number like that. And... and could he have pushed it? I don't know. But I think what they're really getting at is, yes, technically you're correct. I think what they're getting at is they're saying, you got this one guy that's so influential that he can move it one way or the other. And in response to that, what you're seeing is, I mean, this guy is just freaking brilliant. Um, you see, he, everybody's calling for Vitalik to become more and more um uh, uh, active while he is saying you guys want this to survive i need to lessen my role not because he doesn't care but because he does care um, so people can't say that this is eve is you know v chain no, no no connection to v chain but like there's just the dollar chain and i think that's what they're getting at you know th there's also another component to this let's 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 be fair for a second this was infant this was the first experiment of this type of chain of a smart contract chain 13 percent of all the ether was in the dow at the time what choice did they have i think there was only two choices it was fork or die i think if they didn't fork i think ethereum would have been done so i'm not but wouldn't it wouldn't it have set a good precedent though sacrifice ethereum for the sake of long-term immutability but everyone's money's at stake so why would i do that i see what you mean I'm not, you know, I wasn't, actually, I don't really, I, you know, to, to be fair, I have no, I didn't have any sympathy for the Dow investors. I was a, they they I, know what they were getting into. I, I was a vocal opponent of the Dow and a lot of other people were. Once it hit 30 million, a lot of us were publicly saying, stop, 
because we knew it was an experiment. This wasn't this wasn't news flash to everybody that this was an experiment of what they were doing. So a lot of people are. Getting, How were they able to raise so much money? I mean, it was like it herd mentality. Number one, you didn't feel like you had much to lose. Number two, so you took people took their entire hoard and threw it in there. You know, it was almost like a you know, not literally, but like a refund contract. I mean, you, you could so people are like, oh, let me just stick everything in here for now. You know, and what if maker goes bad? You know, it's like then people can say, well, why did everybody put it in there? You know. That's not an exact uh, analogy, so to, you know, don't really jump up and down. But I mean, I'm just uh, conceptually, and it was so early. You know, people, Bitcoin may have been part of the problem, actually, in, in, in a perverse way, is that people just didn't feel like you could lose, you know, money like that in that manner. Yeah, you could get hacked, you know, or centralized exchanges of things, Matt Docs could happen, but people didn't really think about something like a DAO, because that uh, concept didn't exist, or a DAP, that concept didn't exist, that that could get hacked. So, like, the, nobody, the concept wasn't even there that people understood the danger, I think. Um, and Bitcoin being so secure, um, nobody's ever hacked it, I think, gave people a sense of complacency. So, that's, that's, a, that's a testament to Bitcoin. Um, I, I, it is. You know, there, there's, there was no right answer there. You know, I mean... If they did it and it kept killed, would it have restarted? Would the smart contract movement have restarted? That's what other people have said to me too. Yeah, I, he maybe it's a lesson to have learned. The fact that we even talking about it today is the lesson. I, you know what, you you're, you're hitting on the you're actually hitting it. It's not whether or not he made the right decision. It's whether or not that decision was so damn controversial that it's going to be debated on and on and on. And that's probably never going to happen again. Because, and you saw yeah. it with the parody hack. I mean, there was like, Jesus, the guy, you know, I mean, it's just Everyone sitting, thought it would happen again. Wrong. No, sorry. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Yeah, we're not going, you know, the, the controversy was. So I, I, I applaud the Bitcoin maximalists that made this such a big issue. I think you could get one. I mean, I think given the nature of the earliness of the tech, maybe it's possible they could have one mulligan, you know, and like it was just, that, you know, but I don't, because I, I don't see that ever happening again. My yeah, bigger, that's a good point. My bigger concern is not, you know, somebody, you know, one small group of people that are part of the project. My bigger concern, which has not happened, but I predict will happen in a, in a dramatic fashion, such as a Mt. Gox, is there are meaningful assets placed on a chain and collusion happens and those assets are gone. And then people will realize that all these chains have some centralized component to them that means that there's a point of weakness that means there can be collusion. So when there's actual real money at stake or real assets at stake or when there's an incentive now to collude, you think we'll get the real stress test of, of these block of these blockchains? We what you're saying is we haven't actually seen real, real stress tests of these blockchains and decentralization because it's still all pretty much a science experiment. Yeah, but what you're seeing are uh, two things you're seeing. Number one, you're seeing the real big value is security token. That's going to be the most valuable thing on chain. And that's Wall Street. And what you're seeing Wall Street saying, we don't trust any of these chains. Therefore, we're going to do our own permission chain. Now, another, that's stupid. Well, but you say, OK, so this is you asked about lessons of the Internet. This is the exact same conversation we had about intranets and Internet. I don't you know. Everybody was like, I don't trust the Internet. And so intranets were all the rage. How did that work out? You know, eventually Jeff Bezos said, get over it when he was talking about credit cards on the Internet. And that kind of meant, you know, trust the Internet and get over it. Um, and they did. But, but what's happening here is they don't have that internet that web 3.0 other than bitcoin and ethereum but neither one either one doesn't suit the purpose in bitcoin for their purposes or ethereum doesn't scale for their purposes not yet um everything else they're, they're not willing to trust but i think it's just a transitional i think these permission chains you know there'll be some use for them but eventually they'll go on chain once they have a chain that they can trust uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of how clueless people are. People just don't understand this concept uh, that there's decentral lack, any lack of decentralization could lead, let's put it really clearly. If you're not fully decentralized, your money could get stolen. 
Like, like I mean, it's like that's the, it's very simple as that. You know, if it's not fully decentralized, your money can get stolen. That's it. Anything you have on these chains can get stolen by anyone who has enough money to want to steal it from you. Right. It's as simple as that. Right. Now, if you have a proof of stake system, uh, is it is it impossible? It, yeah, it's pretty damn hard because you've got so many things. You know, you're not just building some hardware. You're literally bidding up your own price. How sure. Can you get to the fifty one percent attack, and then there's all kinds of other things with slashing and you know not being able to bond that quickly and everything that are you know protected. It's almost virtually impossible. But but the key thing is that it's not structurally. Um, it's structurally de- fully decentralized. You know that's not a structural issue. Uh, but in practice, it has to be. In practice, it has to be as well. So I don't say if you're structurally decentralized and in practice you're not. That's, that sucks too. That doesn't work. You know, and so uh, like with Casper Labs, we're very con- you know our I, I'm the chairman of the parent company of Casper Lab, and our our mo- our on, on our, all our business cards we have ADAP. And that sounds for as decentralized as possible. And that's a reminder. I love it. As decentralized as possible. Every decision. And by the way, we made some decisions that had nothing to do with the chain, but they weren't what we we felt that they were not in a decentralized philosophically. They weren't matching up with our, 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 you know, uh, philosophy and mission. And so we decided not to do it. Um, and I think the world is, you, know, you need, unfortunately, you're going to have the Mt. Gox um, collusion moment, you know, the equivalent of that or the Dow equivalent of that. And you know, I mean, there was a chain recently where there was a big asset, and I'm going to name the chain, but there was a huge asset going on the chain. And they were going to put the, the, the not anytime soon, but I, I called, I happened to know there was several players in the press release, and I happened to know them, and I called them, and I got them on a call, and I said, how did this happen? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, how, how did this company, because it was a massive amount of value, uh, how did these guys decide to put this value on this chain? And they said, oh, well, somebody on our board knew this guy and told him he could do a security token and we could put it on chain. I said, are these guys aware? And this particular chain has a clear, you know, centralized component. Because he, he's going to wear it. And, and the shocking thing was, this is how much education is, the guys who were running the deal on the on the blockchain side, they were not aware of it. <laughs> They're like, what do you mean? And I said, Interesting. Well, I said, well, you know. Steve, yeah. um, Steve, how can people follow you if they want to follow your endeavors or, and everything you're working on? Sure. So um, you, you can trail my car. I can tell you what kind of car it is. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Uh, but more importantly, um, on my Twitter. So it's at Steven, S-T-E-V-E-N, and, and Nureyoff, N-E-R-A-Y-O-F-F. So it's S-T-E-V-E-N, N-E-R-A-Y-O-F-F. Steven, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, awesome, You've Charlie. Thank you. Enlightened and turned the heads of, of our listeners today. Uh, thanks a lot. Enjoyed a lot. Be good. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. New episodes of Untold Stories go live every Tuesday at 7 a.m. EST. Links to our Apple and Spotify channels are in the show notes. You can also follow me on Twitter, Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation. See you next week.